2018, Casey Scudin. In 2022, a highly decorated NYFD firefighter named Casey Scudin lost his life where he least expected it, courtesy of a tree that fell on his SUV during a windstorm. The 45-year-old and his family were in Asheville, North Carolina to celebrate his upcoming birthday and Father's Day when the freak accident occurred at a popular tourist destination known as the Biltmore Estate. Scudin was crushed to death by the tree and one other family member survived with injuries. Everyone else in the vehicle survived with minor injuries. The family was understandably devastated by the loss of their husband, son, and father, who devoted his career to rescuing others from danger. A similar incident happened in Kurdalin, Idaho in November 2023, when a tree suddenly fell onto a 68-year-old woman's car while she was driving. The driver was dead by the time emergency responders arrived. It wasn't windy out when the tree toppled out of the median and into the roadway leading authorities to label the tragedy a freak accident as they work to figure out what caused the tree to fall. The investigation appears to be ongoing. 17. Paul Mason In a disturbing case of mistaken identity that ended in death, 52-year-old Qatar National Bank CEO Paul Mason was attacked by a complete stranger on a London sidewalk in December 2020. The killer, 35-year-old Stephen Allen, rushed up to the victim and punched him square in the face three times, causing Mason to fall over and hit his head on the pavement. Allen fled the scene in a racial as Mason lay helpless on the ground, leaving bystanders under the impression that the attack had been totally random. As the victim clung to life in the hospital, police got to work finding the man responsible for his condition. Mason died six months later, turning the case into a murder investigation. Detectives learned that Alan had mistaken Mason for someone he believed had stolen his friend's cell phone. He was allegedly extremely drunk at the time of the deadly assault. Further investigation revealed that Mason had reacted non-combatively in the few short moments before he'd been punched in the face. Alan pleaded guilty to manslaughter and was acquitted of murder. He was sentenced to three years and nine months in prison, much to the disappointment of Mason's family, who felt the punishment was far too light for the crime. Mason's loved ones also blamed Alan for the death of Paul's brother Simon, who passed away three months after Paul due to the unbearable grief he felt. Alan's lawyer insisted his client was remorseful, but the expression meant little coming from someone who received a slap on the wrist for tearing a family apart. 16. Susan Hodgson 60-year-old Susan Hodgson was on vacation in San Francisco in 2023 when she received a phone call from her neighbor asking if she was demolishing a rental house she owned. The property was vacant at the time, but Hodgson would have never torn down the house, which had been in her family for 40 years. She sent her brother-in-law over to the property, where he found workers tearing the home apart and accumulating a pile of debris. When he asked the crew for their work permit, they realized they were at the wrong address and quickly vacated the property. According to the Washington Post, Hodgson's late husband Chris bought the house in the 1980s. He and Susan rented it out while raising a family elsewhere, then spent several years living at the property. After Chris passed away in 2011, Susan downsized to a home that required less upkeep but still oversaw and maintained the property she moved out of. Hodgson called the police, who are refusing to investigate the case because they say it's a civil matter. In the meantime, the construction company responsible for the mix-up has allegedly dodged Hodgson's phone calls, squashing the family's hopes of resolving the issue outside a courtroom. But she can't afford an attorney and has been left feeling helpless and like she's without options. The construction company issued a statement to Fox News saying it was investigating the incident, but for now, the home remains a heap of destroyed wood, bricks, and shingles. 15. Manuel Marquez Manuel Marquez was driving his friend's car in Tucson in November 2022 when federal agents suddenly surrounded the vehicle. They thought he was a wanted man named Eduardo and took him into custody at gunpoint. Marquez denied being Eduardo and repeatedly requested an attorney. 
He was told that law enforcement had been searching for Eduardo for 11 months following a domestic dispute with his partner. Police didn't seem interested in believing that they had the wrong person, according to Marquez, who later told News 4 Dunkson that one officer accused him of playing games. When Marquez went before a judge, he explained that they had the wrong person and asked for a lawyer. The judge allegedly said he couldn't help Marquez and sent him back into custody, where he claims he was denied a phone call and held in solitary confinement. In the meantime, his family reported him missing. The sheriff's office ran a check to see if he was in jail, but since he was in jail under someone else's name, law enforcement failed to realize he was being detained. Marquez was eventually released with a future court date, and the prosecutors soon discovered that he was a victim of mistaken identity and dropped the case. During his interview with the News 4 Tungsten, Marquez claimed that the Tungsten Police Department refused to let him file a complaint until he got the media involved. An agency spokesperson told the station that Marquez refused to identify himself during the traffic stop and that he was arrested for it. But Marquez feels that law enforcement should have been calmer in their approach to the situation, and he said he wants to make sure this doesn't happen to anyone else. 14. La Follette Henderson Father of six, La Follette Henderson discovered his love of trucking during his late 50s and took it on as a full-time profession. His new career was tragically cut short three years later in 2023, when a train bridge collapsed on his truck in Pueblo, Colorado. The coal train that was passing over the bridge derailed, causing the cars to tip over and the structure to buckle. Henderson's truck was crushed, and he was the only person to die in the freak accident. His loved ones were left reeling by the freak tragedy, which would have been completely avoided if it hit the road just a few minutes earlier or later than he did. He had no way of knowing what was about to happen, but his family feels haunted by how he was truly in the wrong place at the wrong time. An investigation by the National Transportation Safety Board appears to be ongoing. Preliminary findings suggest that a broken rail caused the derailment, and investigators are now working to determine what caused the broken rail. 13. Vanished Cabin Michigan State Police received an extremely unusual call in February 2022, when a man discovered that his 28 by 12 foot cabin had vanished from its property in Cold Springs Township. The owner had lived in the small, prefabricated structure for a few years before moving elsewhere, but he still owned it and checked on it from time to time. Lacking any other logical explanation, police concluded that the cabin was most likely loaded onto a trailer and stolen. Describing the case as kind of a weird situation, investigating trooper Matthew Scott declined to go into deep detail, but said that investigators had some leads and suspects in mind. At the same time, the owner reportedly said he had no idea what had happened to his cabin or who might have stolen it. He wasn't even sure exactly when it was stolen, and was only able to narrow the window of its disappearance down to a month-long period between his visits to the property. In March 2022, police located the missing cabin in Orange Township roughly 17 miles from where it disappeared. The final part of the mystery was solved nearly a year later in early 2023, when 43-year-old Jeremy James Knoll was arrested on suspicion of stealing the cabin. According to authorities, the missing building was found during the execution of a search warrant at Knoll's property. The suspect had allegedly tried hiding the cabin with large pieces of sheet metal and by altering its appearance. Knoll was charged with receiving and concealing stolen property. While announcing the charges, a police spokesperson said that Noel may not have acted alone and that the investigation was ongoing. 12. Louisiana Super Fog Leads to Massive Car Pileup At least eight people were killed and dozens more were injured when a combination of wildfire smoke and fog, or super fog, caused a 168-vehicle pileup along a Louisiana highway in October 2023. The fog became so thick that visibility levels were reduced to almost zero as cars began crashing into each other along Interstate 55 in St. John the Baptist Parish. 26-year-old Dominic Lawyer later told the New Orleans Advocate that he was driving a rental car over Lake Pontchartrain 
when he realized the traffic ahead of him had come to a dead stop. He slammed on his brakes, just in time to avoid hitting the vehicle in front of him, and fled over the median onto the other side of the highway to avoid being caught in the mess. Moments later, he watched as car after car smashed into the stop traffic. Only one vehicle ended up in the water. It belonged to 55-year-old Zach Barton who was on his way to Mississippi to go hiking. The vehicle struck his pickup truck so hard that it flew over the guardrail. Barton told the advocate that he was initially scared that he was going to die, but realized he was going to be okay as he and his partner climbed out of the trunk's passenger window. As they worked their way to safety, they kept hearing cars crashing on the highway above. The portion of the roadway the Barton flew off was filled with burning vehicles, and he realized that it was probably better to have ended up in the water. It took hours for investigators to determine the total number of deaths, injured individuals, and vehicles involved. Over the following weeks, the infamous Superfog continued to cause serious car accidents in the region. Superfog can form suddenly, including on days with little to no visible fog, and it can quickly reduce visibility to 10 feet or less, taking a person's normal routine from uneventful to potentially deadly in a matter of minutes. 11. Blake Gober During a traffic stop for speeding in Louisville, Kentucky in 2023, 33-year-old U.S. Marine Corps veteran Blake Gober was shocked to learn that there was a warrant out for his arrest. He was accused of stealing a Hertz rental car in West Virginia three years earlier, but he was innocent of the crime and didn't realize he was wanted. Gober told the police that he'd returned the car he was accused of stealing, but law enforcement knew little about the case beyond the fact that there was a warrant. He sat in jail for five days, thinking he would get the misunderstanding cleared up, but he ended up being indicted on felony theft and grand larceny charges a few months later. Determined to clear his name, Goba hired a lawyer and fought the case. The original police report and the indictment stated that Goba had rented a Nissan Sentra, but had actually rented a Nissan Versa. There were no agents on duty when he dropped it off at Regan International Airport in Washington, D.C., so he left the keys inside. Hertz accused him of keeping the car for three months without paying, when in reality he'd stuck to the one-day agreement and returned the car as promised. Gober's attorney argued that Hertz had reported the wrong car stolen, while the company blamed police for erroneously identifying the car as a Sentra in their report about the theft. The lawyer fired back by accusing Hertz of falsely blaming the police for its own mistakes. After concluding that Hertz provided unreliable information to the police, a West Virginia court dropped the case. Goba is just one of hundreds of innocent people who's been arrested in recent years based on false allegations that they stole rental cars from Hertz. Several people have been held at gunpoint by law enforcement, and some have even served time. Hearns admitted to a series of failures and mistakes that led to the false arrest of at least 364 people and was ordered to pay out $168 million to the victims. But the company stood its ground in Gober's case and has yet to apologize for its alleged wrongdoings. 10. Jake Bashford A typical Sunday afternoon turned deadly for 27-year-old father of two Jake Bashford in October 2023 who fell victim to a freak accident while washing his car. As he cleaned the vehicle outside his Rockhampton, Queensland home, it suddenly began to roll. The car struck Bashford and then crashed into a nearby fence. Bashford died from his injuries at a local hospital. An investigation into the cause of the crash is ongoing. A similar tragedy occurred in Clio, Michigan just days earlier, when a 68-year-old woman was run over by her car while getting her mail. In this case, the driver accidentally left the car in gear. Investigators believe that when she noticed the vehicle rolling away, she ran after it but tripped and fell in the vehicle's path. In one particularly bizarre accident that occurred in November 2022, a 45-year-old Swiss woman was run over three times by her own car. She parked on a hill and was most likely trying to retrieve something from her trunk when the vehicle rolled backwards and ran her over for the first time. 
The car struck another vehicle and rebounded, running the woman over again. And it ran her over for a third time after hitting a sidewalk and once again being sent in the opposite direction. The driver survived, but with severe injuries. 9. New Homeowners Make Horrifying Discovery A pair of new homeowners in Henry County, Alabama were cleaning up a mess left behind by the previous occupants in 2023 when they cracked open a deep freezer sitting in the backyard and saw a human hand. They immediately called the police, who identified the heavily decomposed remains as belonging to 19-year-old Logan Michael Haustet, the son of the couple who'd most recently lived at the property. Logan had shared the home with his father, 44-year-old Michael Shane Haustet, and his mother, 43-year-old Karen Tysinger Haustet. Michael and Karen had moved out about a month earlier for skipping on rent, but police believe Logan may have been dead for two or three months by the time his body was discovered. With their recently bought property now a crime scene, the situation certainly threw a wrench into the new homeowner's plans. In the meantime, investigators worked to get to the bottom of what happened to Logan, who suffered from spina bifida and other medical issues. According to law enforcement, Michael Halstead claimed he was bipolar and that he didn't remember how his son ended up in a freezer in the backyard because he was having an episode at the time. He also told police that his wife had no part in Logan's death. The Halsteads both face one count each of abuse of a corpse and reckless manslaughter. They remain in Henry County Jail amid the ongoing investigation. 8. Ina Cervantes what began as an ordinary workday at a medical center in Redwood City, California in early 2023 quickly took a terrifying turn for a nurse named Ina Cervantes. She was tending to a patient in an MRI room when the magnetic force of the machine suddenly pulled the patient's hospital bed toward it. The patient fell out of the bed and Cervantes was pinned between the bed and the machine. An MRI technologist discovered the chaotic scene after overhearing the nurse's screams. Cervantes suffered crushing injuries that required emergency surgery, including a severe laceration requiring the removal of two embedded screws. MRI expert Tobias Gilk told reporters that once an MRI hooks to an object, it doesn't stop being magnetically attracted to it. The machine will keep pulling and pulling to try to get the object as close to it as possible. Investigators faulted the hospital for several safety breaches that they say caused the accident. Cervantes and the patient were left unsupervised by MRI personnel. The magnetic room door was left open and the emergency safety alarm never sounded. Per the facility's policies, gurneys and other metal objects are not allowed in the MRI room. Records obtained by local station KTVU showed that some employees received inadequate training. A facility spokesperson described the accident as a rare occurrence and vowed to implement whatever measures are deemed necessary to ensure that a similar incident never happens. The company that owns the medical center is facing a possible $18,000 fine for multiple violations, including the accident involving Cervantes. 7. Murder by Food Poisoning Four Australians became violently ill within hours of attending a weekly lunch gathering in late July 2023. The Beef Wellington meal was served by 49-year-old Erin Patterson at her home in the Victoria town of Leon Gatha. It was eaten by all four guests, which included Patterson's former in-laws, Don and Gail Patterson, her sister, Heather Wilkinson, and Heather's husband, Ian. Patterson had invited her ex-husband to the gathering, but he skipped out, only to learn later on that the decision most likely saved his life. Based on toxicology reports, investigators concluded that the beef wellington most likely contained death cap mushrooms, an extremely poisonous species responsible for an estimated 90% of mushroom-related deaths worldwide. Within hours of ingesting the deadly fungus, a person will experience nausea, diarrhea, and other gastrointestinal symptoms. The mushroom's toxins cause the liver and kidneys to shut down. Many sufferers experience a period of feeling unbearably ill before experiencing sudden relief. 
then they die. The damage caused to the body is irreversible, and surviving a poisoning depends largely on getting treatment as quickly as possible. But even then, survival is far from guaranteed. Within a week of the poisoning, three out of the four individuals with poisoning died. The sole survivor, Ian Wilkinson, remained in the hospital fighting for his life. He survived and was released two months later, with the expectation that he'll make a full recovery. Meanwhile, members of the public were quick to suspect Erin Patterson of murdering the victims, since she prepared the meal. Patterson maintained her innocence and allegedly claimed that she used a combination of mushrooms that were bought at two different markets. In a statement, she said she loved the people who lost their lives and would never harm them. She also claimed that she ate some of the beef wellington herself and that she was hospitalized with severe stomach pains later that evening. The police initially urged the public not to jump to conclusions and conceded that the mushrooms may have been mistakenly identified as safe to eat. But they were singing a different tune following a lengthy investigation into the case, and Patterson is now facing three counts of murder and five counts of attempted murder. Four of the attempted murder charges relate to previous instances in which her estranged husband became sick after eating food she prepared. She continues to maintain her innocence from behind bars as she awaits the next steps in her case. 6. Marek Fekko During what began as a normal weekday in October 2022, 47-year-old Marek Fekko overheard his wife of 11 years in bed with another man while checking the couple's baby monitor app. Fekko's wife had turned the monitor around in the couple's bedroom so that it wouldn't film what was going on but she forgot to mute it so that it wouldn't pick up sound. A court would later hear about how Fekko had known about the affair between his wife and a former colleague for quite some time. He hadn't found the right moment to confront his wife about it yet, and he probably wasn't expecting that time to come when he was at work. Overcome by rage, the infuriated husband left work and drove home, determined to finally call his wife out on her infidelity. Fekko stormed into the house and demanded to know where his wife's secret lover was. He grabbed a kitchen knife and began threatening to kill the man with it as he fled the home and locked himself in his car. Luckily, nobody was hurt, although Fekko created some significant legal problems for himself. After spending eight weeks in jail and enduring the court process, he pleaded guilty to a fray and possessing a knife in a public place with no reasonable excuse. After considering Fekko's lack of a criminal history, his glowing character references, and the understandable difficulty of containing one's emotions right after they catch their partner cheating, the judge imposed an 18-month community order, which meant he would avoid a more serious punishment as long as he followed certain rules and stayed out of trouble. 5. Natalie Markham A mother from Anderson, Indiana, named Natalie Markham experienced every patient's worst nightmare in October 2023 when law enforcement informed her that the body of her 32-year-old son Kevin had been found dead along the White River. Officers tentatively identified the body as Kevin Markham after finding his driver's license in the drowning victim's wallet. And at first glance, the corpse in the cell phone photo shown to Natalie looked like her son. It unfortunately made sense to Natalie that Kevin might be dead. He was homeless and suffered from schizophrenia, and the circumstances of the drowning sounded like a situation she could picture her son ending up in. Natalie visited the morgue and confirmed the identity of the corpse. She then broke the sad news to relatives and began making funeral arrangements. One family member was so overcome by grief that she ended up in the hospital. A few days later, police informed Natalie that they'd found Kevin alive and well. The man who died was named Andrew Mason. He and Kevin knew each other according to Natalie, who was furious over the mix-up. She told local station WTHR that the morgue was dimly lit and she wasn't given any privacy, so she was hasty in making the identification. Since then, she's spoken out about how she hopes nothing like this ever happens to another family. 4. Chris Rowley With a broken neck, fractured spine, nine broken ribs, blood in his lungs, and other injuries. 
59-year-old Chris Rowley seemed at first glance like he'd been in a terrible car accident. But he got the host of serious injuries by tripping on his hairless cat at his apartment in Leicestershire, England one evening in October 2023. The freak accident began when the cat wrapped itself around Rowley's leg near the top of his stairs. He tripped and tumbled down 14 steps before landing at the bottom in severe pain and barely able to move. Couldn't get up, his phone was dead, and his wife was working the overnight shift, leaving him stranded at the bottom of the staircase for 14 hours straight while he bled from a head injury. Rowley's wife arrived home the next morning to find her husband lying in a pool of blood and yelling in pain. She called paramedics, who promptly came by to pick Rowley up and take him to the hospital. The responding EMTs had to drug the ailing senior citizen just to get him in the ambulance because of how excruciating it was just to move. One single misstep cost Rowley two weeks in the trauma unit, followed by an ongoing recovery the doctors predict will last for months to come. They believe it could take up to a year before Rowley's back on his feet and he now suffers from seizures. The long-term injuries have also put the family in a financial bind now that Chris is no longer working. Despite all this, he still loves the family cat and harbors no anger or ill will toward the feline tripping hazard. 3. Mistaken Identity Kidnapping A Florida man was leaving his Fort Lauderdale home one day in October 2023 when a man in a fake police uniform approached him and forced him into a car where another man was waiting. The suspects covered the victim's head and drove to an Airbnb in Plantation, tossing his cell phone out the window along the way. During the drive, the kidnappers demanded to know where the money is, but the victim had no idea what they were talking about. Upon arriving at the Airbnb, the kidnappers and a third suspect questioned the victim about his identity. They retrieved his license from his wallet and quickly realized they had abducted the wrong person. Their intended target was the victim's co-worker. The suspects nevertheless forced the man into a bathroom where they put several masks over his head and waterboarded him. They also threatened him with guns and numerous other objects, including tasers and a power drill. After receiving word that the man they originally meant to kidnap had arrived at his job at a strip club in Pompamo Beach, the abductors loaded the victim into a car and drove there. They ordered the victim to enter the club and lure their intended target outside, but the man went inside and told employees about what was going on. To ensure a hasty response, he dialed 911 and called in a fake bomb threat. Brothers Jeffrey Arista and Jonathan Arista were taken into custody, along with a third suspect named Raymond Gomez. The men each faced multiple charges including kidnapping, conspiracy to kidnap, and aggravated assault and battery. If convicted as charged, they could face life in prison. Raymond Gomez allegedly admitted to his role in the abduction. He claimed that he and his co-conspirators carried the crime out at the direction of a fourth unnamed individual, who told them that the intended target owed money. 2. Sylvester Hayes 27-year-old father of four Sylvester Hayes was on his way to pick up breakfast for his family one day in 2021 when Dallas police officers pulled him over for failing to signal ahead of a stop sign. He cooperated and handed over his license and registration, but was confused when a cop returned to the car and instructed him immediately to get out of the car. Hayes tried asking what was going on. He'd never been arrested before and had no idea why the police were taking him into custody. Without offering an explanation, multiple officers forcibly removed him from his vehicle, wrestled him to the ground, and handcuffed him. When the cops saw that there was a gun in the car, more of them joined in the takedown, even though the gun was lawfully registered and Hayes had let them know about it. After being put in the backseat of the cruiser, Hayes overheard two officers talking about how they might have apprehended the wrong suspect. As it turned out, a man with the exact same name and a slightly different spelling was wanted on an outstanding warrant. The police nevertheless booked Hayes into custody on suspicion of resisting arrest and unlawful possession of a weapon. He spent several days in jail, resulting in the loss of his job as a security guard. 
The criminal case against Hayes was eventually dropped, but the arrest caused lasting damage to his life. In addition to being fired from his job, which he relied on to support his family, he claims to suffer from long-term injuries sustained during the arrest. Hayes is suing the city of Dallas and several police officers for unlawful arrest, excessive use of force, and violations of his Fourth Amendment right against unlawful searches and seizures. He's seeking unspecified damage and has requested a jury trial. And now for number one. But if you want to hear even more stories, stay tuned for some extra content that you might have missed. 1. Accidental Bomb Threat Sometimes things get lost in translation in the worst possible ways. This was certainly the case for a Russian-speaking tourist from Azerbaijan who used the wrong vocabulary while trying to order a fruit juice in Brazil. According to news sources, the 36-year-old mistranslated the word for pomegranate to bomb using a language app and wrote his request on a napkin. He handed it to the cashier and waited for his drink, not realizing how his order would be interpreted. An employee called the police, and five officers soon approached the tourist on foot with their guns in hand. The suspect complied with the officer's orders to get on the ground and was promptly handcuffed and taken into custody. Authorities searched both the suspect and his hotel room, and the language-related mix-up was cleared up during questioning. After consulting the country's counter-terrorism force and finding no weapons in the man's possession, police were willing to believe that the man had made an honest mistake, and they let him go. Number 10. MS-13 the most dangerous gang currently active right now in the United States of America is by far the MS-13. For years now, the violent MS-13 gang, which has its origins in El Salvador, has been terrorizing New York City, Long Island, and the surrounding area. According to the New York Times, federal prosecutors have linked the gang to over 55 murders in just the past 10 years. The gang has perpetrated a wave of violence that has left entire blocks bloody. The MS and MS-13 stands for Mara Salvatrucha, and there are thousands of members of this gang all across the country. Most of the gang members are immigrants from Central America. Just recently in May, 10 men were charged in taking part in three murders in Queens, one of them on the platform of a subway, the other out in the open on a sidewalk, and the other near a public park. One of the victims was only 17 years old, beaten and strangled after the MS-13 gang members saw his tattoos and thought he was a member of a rival gang. In the end, he wasn't, and the MS-13 members killed a perfectly innocent person simply because he had the wrong tattoos. Number 9. Bloods and Crips The Bloods have been around for years, nearly five decades to be exact. They formed in 1972 in Los Angeles as a street gang to rival an earlier street gang called the Crips. The Bloods can be identified by their members wearing the color red, while the Crips can be identified by the color blue. But have you ever wondered why these two gangs hate each other so much? The rivalry began even before the Bloods were formed as a real group. It started in the 1960s when a gang of Crips attacked two students at the Centennial High School in Compton. After the attack, one of the victims formed a new gang dedicated to protecting other people from the violent Crips. But the Crips were unstoppable, beating and killing everyone who got in their way, including other gangs like the Black Pea Stones, the Athens Park Boys, and the Pirus. By 1978, a lot of these smaller gangs had formed an alliance and named themselves the Bloods. They then began securing different sections of the neighborhood that the Crips weren't allowed in. Thus began the territory wars. But all these years later, the blood rivalry is still ongoing. Today, the Bloods have at least 15,000 active members in the eastern United States. The gang is heavily involved in the distribution of crack cocaine, and to be honest, that's pretty much their only game. Number 8. Aryan Brotherhood The Aryan Brotherhood is a savage gang of neo-Nazis that operate both inside and outside of prisons in the United States. There are an estimated 20,000 members of what has been referred to as the oldest and most notorious racist gang anywhere in the country. According to the FBI, the Aryan Brotherhood makes up a significantly small percentage of the prison population, yet is responsible for the most murders. Like most street gangs, the Aryan Brotherhood focuses on drug trafficking, extortion, murdering people for money, and prostituting their fellow inmates for cash. As you most likely already know, the organization is white only. They're the most hardcore racists anywhere in North America. In order to become a member of the Aryan Brotherhood in prison, a new member is typically required to kill another inmate, usually of a different color. The origin of the Aryan Brotherhood isn't something well known. It began in the 1960s at a time when prisons in the U.S. were segregated. 
When segregation ended and the prison inmates began to be locked up with one another, inmates organized themselves into gangs based on race. The Aryan Brotherhood was the all-white gang, believed to have first been formed in the San Quentin State Prison. Number 7. The Yakuza The Yakuza, the notorious Japanese mafia, has a larger influence in the U.S. than many people think. In fact, the Yakuza was once so powerful on U.S. soil that during the Obama administration, they had their assets frozen and were banned from conducting any business in the country. The measures were introduced by the U.S. Treasury Department in response to the increasing trouble with the Yakuza and human trafficking. They also had a pretty hefty hand in money laundering and illegal prostitution. Unlike the violent and disorganized street gangs, the Yakuza operated primarily like shady businessmen. Through their illicit activities, they brought in billions and billions of dollars a year in earning. The U.S. couldn't actually stop the Yakuza from doing business, so instead, they targeted the two men at the top of the crime syndicate, Kenichi Shinoda and Kiyoshi Takayama. They froze their American-owned assets and basically banished them from the states. However, considering there are somewhere around 80,000 gangsters in Japan, others will simply take their place in America and keep up business as usual. Have you ever heard of this gang? Let us know in the comments below, and if you're liking this video, be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe buttons if you haven't already. Number 6. The Mexican Mafia from what we can figure out, the best estimates place the gang being formed in 1957 by Luis Flores during his incarceration at the Dwell Vocational Institution in California. The gang was created to protect Hispanics inside the California prison system, but by 1960 the gang had some serious power. They pushed their influence outside the prisons and began expanding into the public scene, raking in money from gambling, extortion, and the sale of drugs. The Mexican Mafia joined forces with street gangs in East Los Angeles and became an unstoppable force. They had unbelievable influence until the 1990s when police really came down on them and started to pull out the guts of their illegal machine. But in 1995, the FBI had used the RICO Act, the same act used to take down the Italian Mafia, to charge 22 high-profile members. Unfortunately, after the devastating blow to the Mafia's hierarchy, they simply reformed. They're still active today, continuing criminal activities throughout California. They don't wield the same power they used to, but they're definitely still around. Number 5. Barrio Azteca the Barrio Azteca is one of the most savage and dangerous gangs to ever operate in the state of Texas. Their leader is even on the FBI's list of most wanted criminals. Their members just recently murdered a pregnant U.S. consulate and her husband. But their crimes don't stop at murder. They traffic human beings and drugs, they commit torture, and they're known as professional contract killers. They also operate on both sides of the border, with thousands of members in both Texas and Mexico. They're heavily associated with Mexican drug cartels, as well as two other gangs we talked about earlier, the Mexican Mafia and MS-13. But since Barrio Azteca is in bed with the cartels, they also have some cartel enemies. After all, nobody wars with each other quite like the cartels do. If not for their rivalry with the Sinaloa Cartel and Jalisco New Generation Cartel, Barrio Azteca would be significantly more dangerous. But as it is, most of their killing, drug dealing, and human selling is restricted to Texas, specifically around El Paso. Number 4. The Hells Angels There's probably no gang in the United States more notorious than the Hells Angels, properly known as the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club. But a lot of people don't actually know how the club came into being. It started in 1948 as a club for motorcyclists in California. Specifically, it started in Fontana, and they got their name from the bomber crews in World War II who called themselves the Hells Angels. By 1961, the gang had spread all the way in part of New Zealand. They became infamous by 1965 when the Attorney General of California, Thomas C. Lynch, issued a report on how motorcycle gangs were committing hoodlum activities. For their first few years in the spotlight, the Hells Angels were mostly known as dangerous outlaws. They were notorious barroom fighters, they were exceedingly violent, and the process to become one of the members included initiations that often had to do with committing illegal activities and even beating or killing people. It was the 1970s when law enforcement officials began to realize they were manufacturing and distributing methamphetamine. While the Hells Angels have lost much of their notoriety by now, they still have clubs functioning all across the world. Nowadays, they actually do a lot of charity work and toy drives, but their colorful past remains vivid. Number 3. The Mongols The Mongols are a lesser-known bike gang, kind of similar to the Hells Angels. They too were made in California, but a few years later than the Hells Angels in 1969. They were nothing more than a mainstream motorcycle club, their goal to simply hang out and have fun. Today, the Mongols are considered to be one of the most dangerous gangs still in operation in America. They went from a mainstream club full of normal guys to an army of violent bikers in about 15 years. Today, most of the Mongols' 2,000 members are Hispanic males. Most of the favored pastimes is racially motivated violence. They've become known to lash out at African-American civilians and gang members indiscriminately. 
It was the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms that named them the most violent gang in America. This is in part because of the gang war they fought with the Hells Angels in the 1980s, gaining control of Southern California despite being tiny compared to the larger gang. They won the turf war by sheer force of will and unbridled cruelty. Number 2. Simon City Royals The Simon City Royals were formed in 1952, making them one of the oldest gangs in continual operation anywhere in the U.S. They're also one of the largest predominantly white gangs involved in the country. In the 1960s, they were heavily involved with drug smuggling and racketeering, and were often involved in turf wars with other local gangs like the Latin Kings and the Imperial Gangsters. The Simon City Gang battled a gang called the Royals and lost, forcing the two gangs to merge together, becoming the Simon City Royals. The gang wars went on and on, like really on and on without end, until the 1990s when things finally started to calm down. It was always over turf and drug distribution. Today, the Simon City Royals still have a heavy presence in the prison system and still control parts of the Chicago North Side. They're also in Wisconsin and Mississippi. Number 1. The Black Spades The Black Spades is a gang that started off in the Bronx in the late part of the 1960s and became wildly popular in the 1970s. The gang officially formed at a junior high school. They were just a bunch of kids influenced by groups like the Black Panthers and the Nation of Islam. In the beginning, they wanted to organize a fight against racism and bigotry. They policed their local neighborhoods to protect against the incoming scourge of drug dealers and drug addicts slowly taking over the community. There was even a chapter of Black Spades that was entirely female. Unfortunately, the Black Spades became too popular for their own good and started losing focus. The younger members became violent. They devolved into a criminal street gang peddling drugs, and they just kind of disintegrated. Amazingly, the Black Spades made a comeback in 2019 after changing their name to the Black Spades New Direction and becoming a community service program, offering food distribution to the less fortunate and championing anti-violence. Number 10. 17 Stories A woman in Russia has died trying to do some hardcore parkour. She was only 24 years old when she fell down 17 stories to her death. It happened that she was trying to jump from the top of one building to the other and missed. According to St. Petersburg police, she went to the top of the building with her sister and found four local men. The men were experienced parkour experts, but all the expertise in the world didn't protect the young woman's brains from bursting open on the sidewalk below. To understand just exactly how this young girl fell to her death, we need to take a look at the roofs she was jumping between. One of them, the starting point, was quite a bit taller than the other building. She was supposed to run to the edge and then jump, gauging how far to go based on the gap between the buildings. But because she may not have had enough experience, she misjudged the gap between the rooftops. She ended up missing the lower rooftop by a pretty large margin. The result was the same as jumping off the edge of a cliff. She hit the concrete below and was dead. And to make matters worse, the men fled the scene. Number 9. Pavel's Backflip Pavel Kaushin was trying to do a backflip when he died. It's really as simple as that. The guy lost his footing, he happened to be on the edge of a 16-floor building, and then he was gone. Pavel was known to his town for being a parkour daredevil. Just like the young girl that died trying to jump between buildings, Pavel was also from St. Petersburg. But Pavel's death happened way earlier, nearly a decade ago in 2013. He was performing stunts on the rooftop of an old Soviet-style building while his friends filmed his flips and tricks. And for some reason, there's actually a photograph still floating around online of the very second before Pavel's backflip went very wrong. In the world of free runners, it was a huge tragedy, primarily because Pavel was known as one of the best. He did breakthrough stunts, he had some of the most impressive moves, and his videos took the internet by storm. His sudden death showed just how dangerous parkour can be. He had done thousands of flips before, but losing his footing when he came down from that final backflip had him slipping sideways off the roof. He plummeted headfirst like a sack of potatoes onto the pavement below. Number 8. Parkour for Kids 21 children were injured in San Diego at a parkour gym for kids. According to San Diego Fire Rescue, a stairway collapsed at the gym, resulting in complete mayhem. There were at least 50 children attending the nighttime parkour lesson. The platform that collapsed was a wooden deck about 30 feet long. The kids had been running across the deck to reach the upper level of the facility, where there was pizza waiting for them. The stairwell collapsed without any notice. At least four of the victims may have suffered from irreversible spine injuries. The results of the kids were in a very rough shape. It was a total disaster, with nearly half the children in attendance being taken away to the hospital. But the kids weren't the only ones who got injured. Two adults were also hurt in the freak accident. If you're wondering how such an accident could have happened, 
It was because the platform couldn't hold the weight of all those children. It was an obvious breach of safety that may have caused four kids to break their spines. After all this destruction, the child's parkour gym is likely going to be out of business. Number 7. The Little Daredevil At 13 years old, a youngster known only by his first name, Tolia, was something of a little daredevil. He was obsessed with parkour and impressing his friends. After all, what 13-year-old kid doesn't live life on the edge in hopes of being cool? Sadly for Tolia, while showing off one day for his buddies, he slipped and fell 100 feet to the ground below. At the time, he had been dangling by nothing but his fingertips from the ninth floor of an abandoned tower block. His fingers slipped, he desperately tried to hold on, but it was too late. One of the old bricks broke loose, and like the bad guy's death at the end of an action movie, Toya went flailing through the air. His friends heard the thump of his body hitting the ground and ran to get help. According to what one of the kid's friends told reporters, he was in shock when he saw the body. He was so shocked when he saw the kid's mutilated remains that he just sat there for 30 minutes not knowing what to do. And that's the truth about what happens when a person falls that far. Their body breaks and it's truly an ugly scene. What's the craziest thing you ever did to impress your friends when you were a teenager? Whatever you did, did it almost kill you? Let us know how big of a daredevil you were in the comments below. And if you're liking this video, be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe button if you haven't already. Number 6. Saved by the Current In Russia, yet again, a guy trying to do parkour ended up having a disaster. But unlike most parkour disasters, this one ended without anybody dying. The professional parkour maniac, a guy named Sergei Shurikov, was jumping from rooftop to rooftop. As he was doing it, he had a camera clamped to his mouth to capture all the action. This is like a cheap Russian alternative to a simple GoPro attached to a helmet. The day was going fine until he made his final jump. As he leaped off the ledge of the roof, 25 floors above the ground, he made a mistake. He misjudged the distance he was supposed to jump and fell, catching himself just before all was lost on some hanging electric wires. If he hadn't reached out and grabbed those wires, his face would have hit the brick side of the building and the back of his head would have bounced off the concrete below. But miraculously, he grabbed the wires. Yes, they sent a severe electric shock through his body, but he held on nonetheless and pulled himself up to safety. According to what Sergei told his viewers when uploading the terrifying video of his near-death experience, he had already been doing parkour for 13 years. This goes to show that even real pros can misjudge distance and fall to their death. Number 5. Johnny Turner Johnny Turner was 28 years old when he died from a parkour accident. Johnny was famous for traveling all across Europe to practice parkour and doing free running. He was described by friends as a pioneer to the British urban exploration community. He scaled all kinds of buildings throughout UK, such as the Battersea Power Station. He was also a fan of free running through abandoned structures, but Johnny was more than just a free runner. He was a person. According to James Wood, a fellow parkour expert, Johnny was thoughtful, gentle, and one of the most positive people you'd ever meet. It's no wonder everybody was heartbroken when Johnny tumbled off some scaffolding, fell down eight stories, and snapped his neck on the ground. The authorities were a little stingy with the exact details, but we do know Johnny had been practicing parkour at a block of apartments in Waterloo. We also know that he had been doing it at nighttime. Perhaps it was too dark. Whatever the case, he missed his step, flung himself off the scaffolding, and splattered to the ground. Number 4. A Bad Shortcut In India, a student trying to do a bit of parkour to save himself some time ended up dead. The kid was just 19 years old, identified as E. Sikharan. He fell from the third floor of a hostel while trying to leap onto the balcony of the adjacent hospital. If you're confused, let me break it down for you. In India, lots of students live in hostels. It's quite popular in other places around the world as a cheap living alternative. It's the equivalent of American students staying in student housing. Because one hostel was directly beside another, many of the students simply did parkour to travel between them. Instead of going all the way from the third floor to the ground floor, entering through the front door, and climbing back up three stories, people just jumped from balcony to balcony. It was a Tuesday night when the shortcut proved deadly for East Sikharan. As he tried to cross over the other balcony, a gap of only three feet, he slipped and fell between the two buildings. He cracked his skull and splintered his ribs, later dying at the hospital. To make matters even more disturbing, surveillance footage caught every second of the terrifying incident. Before he made the jump to the other balcony and missed, other students can be seen coercing him into doing it. They were beyond shocked when he slipped and fell all the way down to the bottom. Number 3. 11 Floors Down In Spain, yet another teenager has died doing parkour. This teen was 17 years old and he fell 11 floors until he smacked his body to the ground 
and died. He had been climbing inside a construction site. According to the national police who were involved in the investigation, he and some friends were on Holy Guardian Angel Avenue, attempting risky jumps as they climbed higher and higher up the construction site. They were running, vaulting, rolling, and all other verbs included with parkour. But alas, there was one jump that the kid just couldn't make. When he missed, that was the end of him. Paramedics did arrive almost immediately after the accident was reported, but they could do nothing to save the boy's life. The paramedics said that he died immediately upon impact. And that does make sense, seeing as he fell 11 floors. The force of the impact pretty much shot his brains out the back of his skull. He may as well have jumped out of an airplane without a parachute. Number 2. From the Top In China, an expert in parkour fell from the top of a skyscraper like an ant falling out the side of your house. His name was Wu Yongning, and he was known in China for being one of the most courageous daredevils around. He was famous for climbing very tall buildings and taking risky pictures. These pictures were usually of him clinging onto the side of something for dear life. He also happened to be a trained professional, skilled in martial arts, with a background as a stuntman in films. At the time of his death, Wu was trying to earn enough money to fund his wedding and to treat his sick mother. According to what Wu's step uncle told the Beijing News, Wu was planning to propose to his girlfriend the day after he filmed himself doing parkour 62 stories up at the top of the skyscraper. He was going to take the money he earned from the risky pictures, get married, save his mom's life, and be a real hero. Sadly, it didn't go that way at all. As he clung to the side of the building, not secured by any kind of safety harness, he fell. The maniac was trying to do pull-ups over 60 stories up, and he lost his grip. The 26-year-old plummeted all the way to the ground, luckily not to fall directly on someone's head. He died immediately and never got to propose to his girlfriend. And number one, New Year's Day. On New Year's Day in Paris, a 17-year-old parkour enthusiast named Nye Newman met his end. It happened below the city on the Paris metro. Nye came to Paris from England for vacation with his girlfriend. For the previous few years, he had been extremely into parkour, climbing over obstacles and jumping from building to building. He was actually something of an internet sensation and an inspiration to many people. This was because of his positive outlook and enthusiastic lifestyle. In 2016, he did parkour in Hong Kong. He posted photos on his social media of leaping between buildings, even doing tricks at the Giants Causeway in Northern Ireland. But it would be the Paris Metro that finally put the young man's career to bed. And to make matters even worse, Nye brought the accident upon himself. According to the most recent report from the BBC, Nye Newman died when he stuck his head out of the train to take a selfie and hit his head. He and his girlfriend were heading to the Eiffel Tower to see the fireworks for New Year's Eve. While on the train, Nye climbed between two carriages, poked his head out to take a picture, and was struck by an unknown object. There is definitely a reason why you don't stick your head out of a moving train, especially one that's underground. It could have been a pipe, a piece of debris, no one knows. But whatever it was, it hit Nye in the head so hard that he was dead immediately. Number 10. Killer Clown A crazy person with their face tattooed to look like a clown killed their cellmate in California. But the killer clown didn't just murder the inmate with whom they shared the prison cell. He tortured them. It's not exactly clear how they managed to get away with this in a secure prison, but it happened nonetheless. Jamie Osuna severed his cellmate's spine, scooped out his eyes with his bare hands, and sliced open his mouth with a makeshift razor blade so that he looked like a sick caricature of Batman's Joker. The victim in this situation was 44-year-old Louis Romero. Prison guards found him mutilated in a cell that he shared with Jamie on March 9th in the Corcoran State Prison. According to prison officials, Romero had been conscious for a significant portion of the time that he was being cut up. One of the victim's fingers was cut off. He was mutilated beyond repair, and the very last insult was for the killer clown to decapitate him to date. This is one of the most gruesome prison murders ever, and it was committed by a guy who had his face tattooed to look like an insane clown. Number 9. Las Vegas Nazi In Las Vegas, a man covered in terrifying Nazi tattoos killed a 75-year-old woman in her home. It happened back in 2013, though the Nazi was only recently sentenced to spend 44 years locked up. During the court proceedings, Basil Morgan was 26. Two years earlier, he broke into the house of Jean Maine with the intention of burglarizing her. Jean was alone in her house. There was no one there to defend her, and Morgan used this to his advantage. 
he hit her over the head so hard with his pistol that the trigger guard fractured into pieces. And as if beating her with the pistol wasn't enough, he shot her in the back of the head, execution style. When the woman's boyfriend came home, he discovered her face down in the bathroom, already dead. Morgan escaped the house with a suitcase full of items that he stole from the dead woman, then fled the scene with his getaway driver. The getaway driver was Keith Smith, who was sentenced to between 4 and 10 years for his participation in the burglary. But let's go back to this guy's face tattoos for a minute. Morgan has spent his entire life as a ward of the state. As a young child, he was either under the protection of Child Protective Services or locked in a jail cell. As he grew older, he became more and more radicalized. As of now, he has some pretty horrendous tattoos on his face, including a swastika under his left eye, the words Baby Nazi on his neck, and a pair of white supremacist tattoos right over his eyebrows. Number 8. Snack Shack Attack In Oregon, a man was facing multiple charges after he fled from police and went into a grocery store. It happened in Portland, with the first responders being transit police officers. They had received a phone call about a man who broke into the snack shack. He ran away when he saw the officers coming. They chased him. He went into the grocery store, and then he cornered himself in the back stockroom. There was only one way in and one way out. But when the officers tried to take this individual into custody, he put his hands under his jacket and said he was going to shoot them if they didn't get out of his way. Luckily, the officers called his bluff. He didn't have a weapon at all. They got him into custody and locked him up in the Multnomah County Detention Center. He was identified as Matthew Joseph Medlin, and it wasn't his first time having a run-in with the law. In 2014, he was taken into custody after he escaped from prison, which he had initially been in for sexual abuse, assault, and burglary. And once he got out in 2016, he was arrested yet again when police found him living in a dumpster. A few months later, he was arrested another time for trying to bite a police officer and for licking a man's face. What the heck? Speaking of faces, this guy has a terrifying facial tattoo. He's not the kind of guy that officers can forget. He's also not the kind of person that would ever be able to evade the police. He has what looked like bat wings tattooed over his eyebrows, along with a bunch of other strange ink that nobody can make much sense of. Much of his face is tattooed in shades of red and purple, and he even has a purple mohawk. It's a wonder he ever escaped from jail in the first place. Number 7. The I-5 Strangler A serial killer from California, known locally as the I-5 Strangler, was murdered in his prison cell by another convicted killer with 666 tattooed on his face. Between 1977 and 1987, Roger Kipp went on a murderous rampage. This was back when murderers didn't have face tattoos and could blend in with everybody else. He was finally caught and convicted, charged with the killings of at least seven different women and girls. Naturally, he got life in prison. Roger was 81 years old when karma finally caught up with him in his truest form. He was discovered unconscious in his cell at the Mule Creek State Prison. After they took him to the medical center, he quickly passed away. As it turned out, his inmate, convicted killer Jason Budrow, was the one behind the homicide. Jason was in prison for second-degree murder, from strangling his girlfriend to death in 2011. Well, the girlfriend wouldn't be Jason's last. He also strangled the I-5 strangler to death in a bizarre case of irony. When asked why he strangled the strangler, Jason said it started as a sneaky plan to get his cell back so that he had more privacy. But by the time the killing was done, Jason said he felt happy to have avenged all those girls that the I-5 Strangler murdered over 30 years ago. The man with the 666 tattoo on his face gave those girls the justice the justice system never could. The only question now is who will give justice to the girlfriend Jason strangled to get into prison in the first place? Number 6. Guilty Inc. William Bottoms Jr. was found guilty of the double murders in 2017 of Dedrick Dwayne Williams and Muhammad Seed Hussein. But before the case even went to court, his lawyers feared that the jury would condemn him regardless of his innocence, based purely on his space. The reason for this is that William is covered in weird tattoos, from the top of his bald head down to his neck. None of them are particularly offensive, but the fact that his entire face is covered in ink really worried the lawyers. To put it lightly, he looks like the kind of guy that would stab you and rob you in a dark alley at night. In the end, 
William was probably guilty of the murders anyway. He had spent most of his life in and out of prison, usually for petty crimes. But this time, he committed grisly slayings. He became paranoid while taking too many drugs in June of 2017 and gunned down the two victims without mercy, even though his lawyers tried to explain to the jury that he was a, and I quote, good dude. That didn't change the evidence. He had definitely done the killings, so it didn't matter that he had devil horns tattooed in his face. He is a killer, with or without the ink. Do you think William would have had a better chance in court had he not had his face tattooed? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. And if you're liking this video, be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe buttons if you haven't already. Number 5. Charlie Manson's Ashes A man with a sick obsession with Charles Manson has gotten himself a tattoo with the dead cult leader's ashes. How exactly this happened is a long and very confusing story. We should start with Charles Manson, the maniac leader of the Manson family cult that killed seven people in the 1960s, including the famous actress Sharon Tate. Manson was in jail until the day he died in 2017, at the age of 83. He spent almost his entire life behind bars, though his actual sentence was nine consecutive life terms. Technically, Manson needs to resurrect himself and serve his other eight terms. Now for the guy with the tattoo. His name is Patrick Booz. He's not a criminal, but he is about as big of an outsider as a person can get. He has an X tattooed in the center of his forehead, like Charles Manson, and he has the term Helder Skelter tattooed above his right eye. He's an unusual looking man with unusual interests. According to what he told Vice, his most recent tattoo was a once in a lifetime opportunity to make the infamous killer Charles Manson a literal part of him. When Manson died, there was a legal battle to see who would claim his body. One of his grandsons, Jason Freeman, ultimately won the battle and took possession of the corpse. He cremated Manson and kept the ashes. Tattooist Ryan Gillikin claims that he procured a small pinch of the ashes through a friend of Manson's grandson. He then took those ashes and gave Patrick Booz two tattoos he had always been craving. For just $600, Patrick received the X tattoo and the Helder Skelter tattoo, both on his face, using ink mixed with the ashes of Charles Manson. Number 4. Skullface A fugitive with his face tattooed to look like a skull managed to hide for nearly a month after he escaped prison. His name is Corey Hughes, 27 years old. He was arrested in California almost 30 days after he walked off a work crew and vanished. Well, he didn't walk away. He ran for dear life, managing to avoid the police officers and disappear for weeks. It's unclear how he managed to stay hidden, considering his face literally looks like a skull. It's covered in black and gray ink to make it look as though he's a skeleton. The only reason the police apprehend this guy at all is that they received the tip that Corey Hughes was hiding at a residence in Stockton. The cops banged on the door. Nobody answered and so they released a canine unit. The dogs were quick to discover Corey. The cops took him back to jail. And that was it for the man with the skull face. The sheriff's office even wrote on the Facebook page, Escape E. Corey Hughes is home for the holidays. And by home, they meant the San Joaquin County Jail. Number 3. Murder, Murder In Northern Colorado, a 19-year-old named Leonardo Biarato confessed to the brutal shooting of Edward Joseph Boyle Jr. He was sentenced to 32 years in prison for the murder, which happened back in 2018. When arrested, Leonardo had a sort of confession freshly tattooed over his left eyebrow. It was a single word, murder. And while this obviously doesn't count as a real confession, it was pretty obvious that he had gotten the tattoo as a sort of tribute to the murder he had just committed. What a guy. What's really crazy is that it took the police five months to arrest Leonardo for his crime. This is despite the fact that witnesses heard the two men fighting, heard a gunshot, and then Boyle was discovered dead. The tattooed murderer went on the run and managed to evade the authorities for nearly half a year before they caught him and put him away for good. Number 2. Demon Woman In South Carolina, a woman's mugshot went viral in 2017 for her completely black eyeballs. Morgan Joyce Barnes, just 24 years old, was arrested after she invited a strange man into her home and then robbed him at gunpoint. This is according to the Lancaster County Sheriff's Office. She was charged with armed robbery, malicious injury, and kidnapping. Take one look at her. You can tell she's had a pretty rough life. Her black eyeballs just make that much worse. 
According to every single person who's seen the mugshots, she looks like a demon woman. However, the police never did come forward and say whether her eyes were the results of tattoos directly on her eyeballs or if she had simply been wearing contact lenses. In any case, she's very scary looking. Number 1. The Man Baby 29-year-old Corey P. Smiths has the worst tattoos on his face. But it's not just his ugly facial tattoos that make Corey interesting. It's the fact that he looks both like a 50-year-old man and a baby at the same time. He seems to be missing a lot of his hair, but it's hard to tell if that's because it hasn't grown in yet or because it's already fallen out. He's also been arrested multiple times for drinking and driving. His most recent offense saw him three times over the legal limit. It was the fifth time he got a DUI in Two Rivers, Wisconsin. It makes you wonder how he is still able to drive. It's honestly not even clear what his face tattoos are. He has dots along his eyebrows and what appear to be alligators over those, but we could be mistaken. According to court documents, Corey's fifth DUI saw him put on probation. He was also ordered to undergo intoxicated driver assessment to submit random urine tests, to spend 10 months in jail, and to pay nearly $4,000 in fines. But seeing as this was the baby man's fifth offense, he's probably just going to do it again anyway. Thanks for watching. Would you rather be arrested for murder in a case of mistaken identity or miss the last flight home from vacation before a hurricane? Let us know in the comments below and remember to subscribe. See you next time. Bye.